Hi everyone, this is Andrew Primo, Ukrainian-American, reporting about the war in Ukraine. In today's podcast, week 63 of war in Ukraine, and this is the second week of May of 2023. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about Ukraine received a long-range Storm Shadow cruise missile missiles and hit the occupied Luhansk city. Well, I'll give some Bakhmut updates. Ukraine keeps on pushing the enemy out of the region. And Prigozhin drama. Prigozhin claimed that he would leave Bakhmut if he doesn't receive the ammunition. So speaking before the parliament, the British Defense Minister Ben Wallace confirmed that Great Britain is supplying Ukraine with Storm Shadow cruise missiles, the range of which exceeds 250 kilometers. Wallace said, the missiles would allow Ukraine to push Russian forces back from Ukraine's sovereign territory and noted the decision came after Russia continued down a dark path of bombing Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. On May 12th, the armed forces of Ukraine carried out a missile attack on Luhansk with two Storm Shadow cruise missiles, the Russian Federation announced. Russia didn't show a full picture of the place where the cruise missile hit. Some footage is shown from the machine building plan that consequences of the losses are not visible there. But the Russians didn't show the attack on the building of the former Institute of Ministry of Internal Affairs at all. And there were pers- personnel there. And they, were, they, had, they had to suffer significant losses. According to the Russian data, only two Ukrainian planes were used, such as Su-24 bomber, apparently converted to cruise missile carrier, and a MiG-29 fighter. The Russians claim that both planes were shut down, but this is is obviously not true, since it's impossible to hide the downing of warplanes in the central, densely populated areas of Ukraine. And the very nature of use of missiles and the long range of the launch makes it unlikely at all that the planes were spotted. According to available Russian data, important objects in Luhansk were hit by two Storm Shadow missiles. This is the same weight as the warhead of the Point U ballistic missile, but the power is much greater. Also, a significant new factor was the use of at least two AMD-160 aviation missiles and MOLD, which are special modern missiles with a weight of 45 kilos, which simulate the fight of an airplane and a cruise missile, and thus activate and direct radar and anti-aircraft missile systems. The Russians didn't report the use of those missiles as well, but it's logical to imagine that when using the AMD-160B, which forces the Russians' radar to be turned on, the Ukrainian aviation would have to use its already traditional new weapon, self-guided anti-radar missiles harm. That is, the May 12th attack on Luhansk became an example of the implementation of new tactics and the complex use of high-precision means of destruction. And Russia was unable to counter this blow and cover one of its key logistic centers. Since the characteristic of the British range storm shadow missiles are known, we can determine the few factors. The new high-precision long-range weapons with a range up to 560 kilometers, which allow the armed forces to attack any object in the entire occupied territory of Crimea Peninsula, Peninsula and Donbass. The cruise missiles have homing capabilities to attack and destroy not only ground objects, but also any ship of the Russian Federation in Crimea and far out at sea, which further limits the already limited operational area of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea. The use of modern NATO combat aviation tactics by the armed forces of Ukraine 
in order to break through the air defense systems of the Russian Federation. A significant increase in the strike capabilities of all Soviet aircrafts of the armed forces. So, as we see, with the Western Allies' help, Ukraine is rapidly expanding its arsenal of weapons. Our strike capabilities have increased significantly. Supplying such systems as Storm Shadow shows that NATO will do everything to prevent the defeat of Ukraine. A new arms race has begun in the world, and Russia will not be able to win against NATO technology, technology and industry. Provided the scope of the supply of long-range, high-precision weapons increases, even in the conditions of a positional war, Russia will suffer unacceptable losses that it will not be able to recover. So, Bakhmut. The Bakhmut battles is continuing. Lately, our troops acted quite actively as far as the amount of available ammunition and reserves allowed for active actions. Therefore, we had the opportunity to defeat the enemy before. Now, we see that after many months of fighting, both sides have suffered heavy losses, but Ukrainians are more motivated because they're liberating their own land. The enemy cannot hold out in the conditions in which the Ukrainian troops have been fighting for 15 months. We don't have a big ammunition advantage near Bakhmut right now. The Russians still have an advantage in artillery, aviation, and means of destruction. But where the Ukrainians take organized actions, the enemy, even in spite of the superior superiority, cannot hold back. And as you know, Bakhmut turned into a battle of attrition. The enemy is attacking head-on in the direction we know. Our uni units are trying to stop them. I would not say the situation there is a model of actions. Unfortunately, the situation for Ukraine, if you look at the map, is very unaffordable. But because the enemy has covered the Bakhmut city very deeply, there were no prepared defense, defensive lines there. Our people are doing all this in the field. All this is being excavated now with shovels under the fire quite improvised. At the same time, the situation is a little strange because the panic in the post of Russian social networking regarding the situation in the Bakhmut areas reaches the same scale as during the Russian defeat in the east of Kharkiv region in September of last year. The post talk about breakthroughs, collapse of the front line, battles for territories located five kilometers deep from the front line, and something like that. As of today, all I can say is that several brigades of the armed forces of Ukraine are actually conducting local counterattacks in order to reduce Russian pressure on the roads that supply the Ukrainian forces in the city. The deepest advance over the past two years, but past two days, has reached approximately five to six hundred meters. Yes, the Russians fled from many locations, left behind a lot of weapons, ammunition and supplies, actually including a large number of anti-tank guided missiles, which they complain they don't have. They actually do, and or suffered hundreds of casualties. According to Ukrainian military commanders, on May 10th, that their troops had broken through Russian positions in the southern flank of the embattled eastern city of Bakhmut, forcing Russian units back from their position at an important bridgehead of canal. Ukrainian officials and the head of Russian private army Wagner Group Prigozhin said that the Russian troops had lost an area of, Ru of roughly three square miles southwest of the city. If confirmed, it would be the first significant gain for Ukraine in the fight for Bakhmut since pushing Russian forces off the key access road two months ago. The fighting around the city didn't seem, didn't seem to be a part of the broader counteroffensive that Ukraine plans to begin soon, but came amid an uptick in Ukraine's strikes 
behind Russian lines and reports of increased attacks in Russian regions bordering Ukraine. The Ukrainian operation near Bakhmut hit Russian army troops as they were rotating into position and was an opportunist, opportunistic strike on a weak link in the Russian front. The Ukrainians said they broke through Russian lines in the area of fields, ravines and thickest of trees to the southwest of Bakhmut. Ukrainian commanders said several units, including the Azov soldiers in the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade, a special forces unit, the Adam Tactical Group, and the Ukrainian Volunteer Army, a group that includes civilian volunteers, had carried out the attack. A commander of the Ukrainian 3rd Separate Assault Brigade said in a video message that was released early hours of Wednesday morning that his troops had seized Russian positions and inflicted heavy losses on Russian troops. Two Russian companies, until typically with about 100 soldiers each, and Reconnaissance team had been completely destroyed in the fighting, he said. The head of Wagner Group Prigozhin said in a video statement on Tuesday that the Russian flank had been broken, known for his outspoken and often self-serving criticism of Russian military. He accused units of Russian 72nd Brigade of the Army of abandoning their positions. He said everyone fled and exposed a front almost 2 kilometers wide and 500 meters deep. The Wagner forces leader have played a key role in Russia's assault on Bakhmut, but he has frequently blamed Russian military leaders for failing to adequately supply his forces. He realized his statement just as a President Putin was attending the traditional Victory Day military parade in Moscow Red Square. He added that his forces had to move in to prevent a further Ukraine advance. It's good we managed to block it somehow, Prigozhin added. At the same time, Ukrainian General Alexander Sirsky, the commander of Ukraine's ground forces, said in a statement that the attack was a part of defensive operation aimed at stalling the Russian assault on Bakhmut, which has been raging for 11 months, one of the longest and bloodiest battles of this war. The Ukrainian general didn't mention the long-anticipated counteroffensive that Ukraine and its allies have been preparing for months with newly equipped and trained brigades. Ukrainian commanders fighting in and around Bakhmut have said that their role is to prevent the Russian advances while new brigades are trained and assembled to carry out the expected counteroffensive. They also said that they sensed that the Russian army was demoralized and thinly stretched in places along the front line, making them vulnerable. So, Prigozhin, he's actually said in his statement that he wants to withdraw his troops from Bakhmut on May 10th. The statement of the leader of Wagner's private military company is very interesting, as he announced that his terrorists will leave Bakhmut in the Donetsk region on May 10th due to lack of ammunition. We heard many times how he commented on the situation in Bakhmut, how he said during the last month that it was thanks to Wagner's group and him personally that the front lines was holding. If they left, everything would fall apart. He also stated that the Ministry of Defense and the regular Russian army do absolutely nothing. On the contrary, they don't give Wagner, Wagner Group ammunition. They cut off Prigozhin's phone that he can't call anywhere for requests. He was hypocritical in this Russian propaganda media space. And obviously, he was allowed to do so. The Kremlin did it with such an aim that if the situation in the Bakhmut direction really deteriorates, the Russian army will be forced to live there, then the main culprit for this will be the one who spoke the most about it. So the one to blame is going to be Prigozhin. 
that is Prigozhin himself, who said that this was only his personal merit and the merit of these mercenaries from Wagner. Prigozhin obviously understood this game, and he tries to create conditions to avoid this trap. His statement that they will leave and be replaced by the Russian regular army means that at the end, everything will really fall apart. Obviously, there is now another round of under-the-carpet struggle between Prigozhin, the general staff, and the Ministry of Defense of Russia. In the video, Prigozhin and his best in his best traditions described Shoigu and Gerasimov with obscene words. This is one of the manifestations of this typical struggle between these groups of influence in Putin's entourage. This is a standard strategy, a standard approach of Putin himself to ensure that none of this group in his environment has sufficient resources to claim either power or some critical influence in their decision-making system. Therefore, it is an approach of disintegration of these groups among themselves, an approach of permanent struggle between them, which is ultimately controlled by Putin personally. So, the latest news from the aggressor state is not encouraging those of the Russian population who support the war. They see not only the lack of success at the front lines, but also political games and drama undermining the professionalism of the Russian army. The head of the Wagner private army, Prigozhin, who is hated by the Russian army and its leaders, has announced his army withdrawal from the Bakhmut region for a few reasons. Also, Prigozhin's latest statement came a few days ago when he posted a video of himself walking among his dead fighters' bodies and said that Wagner's casualties were grown in geometrical progression every day because of the lack of ammunition, because of the Russian armed forces' commander's fall. He addressed this issue to the top military commanders in the way, Hey, Shoigu, hey, Gerasimov, what is the ammunition? They came here as volunteers and died for you to fatten yourself in new mahogany offices. As a result, Putin immediately asked the Chechen leader Kadyrov to take the lead and send his people to the front lines to replace Wagner's troops. Also, it's well known that the Russian army also hate the Chechen leader and his army for several reasons, but most of all by Federal Security Service, FSB. So Prigozhin understands that with the latest failure to recruit more soldiers for his army and after losing many of his troops in Ukraine, his power is diminishing. Soon, nobody will even ask his opinion in Kremlin. He is not trying to save his soldiers. He wants to keep his power. He knows very well the war is almost likely lost and Putin will not last much longer and he needs to stay influential and powerful. Besides the lack of success in Bakhmut, the Russian installed authorities continue to evacuate the Parisian region residents away from the front lines in the annexed region due to the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive and constant artillery fire. Moreover, Crimean citizens could not leave the peninsula this weekend due to the bridge being closed. There was a several mile long line in cars with people who were hoping to cross the carriage bridge back to Russia. And yesterday, Ukraine's Deputy Minister of Defense, Gabrielov, said, We will start our counteroffensive soon. When and where it doesn't matter. Russia will panic, and you will see even more panic soon. They still don't understand that their propaganda shows a false picture of what is happening in the ground. This war will be won on the ground, not on TV screens or in the internet. With all the recent events, it's obvious that Russia's system and regime will fall apart. 
most likely, we all may witness the fall of the longest serving dictator in Russia. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, share with your friends.